in your prime, you versus uh, Bisping, what happens? I destroy him. Like, do you think the fight would even last one minute? No. Not even close. In I'm fact, gonna, you I, probably I, I, break I, a new, I, I, who would say, I, I, record. I, I, Hey guys, in this video, Frank Dukes is not only going to defend himself, he's going to completely destroy Michael Bisbing, ex-UFC middleweight champion's argument and points he made about Frank Dukes being the number one martial arts fraud. So we're going to give you some fact-based evidence on why Dukes is not and why Michael Bisbing is wrong. Anyway, please try to get this to Bisbing's attention because I think by the end of it, he will realize that he owes Frank Dukes a public apology. Anyway, please help support the channel by liking the video, subscribing, and make sure to share it. This is a really good one. We gotta get it out there. It's gonna be the talk of the uh, martial arts and fight world on YouTube for a while. Oh, by the way, to make sure to get the most out of this video for this kind of manly discussion, make sure you have adequate natural testosterone levels and you can check that out along with a bunch of other things at Let's Get Checked. Go to trylgc.com forward slash Viking Samurai. Use my discount code VS30. And you'll get a really good discount on getting all these different health things checked in the convenience of your own home. <laughs> So let's go over the list of some of the uh, things he had said about you calling you a fraud. Frank Dukes has more bullshit in his life story than Vito Belfort has steroids in his left ass cheek. <laughs> really interesting with this guy saying I'm a fraud and it's like, well, my name's on the side of the U.S. Navy SEAL manual, dude. That, that is true. <laughs> you know, I was just going to say, it's, just, it's a regurgitation of the same old BS that these guys do and it's all spin. You know, it, what I can't find interesting is the evidence is out there. OK, I took Soldier Fortune magazine for repeating the same same stuff to court mm -hmm. or libel and slander. They didn't use truth as a defense, which means everything that they were saying they knew was a lie. They, they argued because it was a public celebrity. They should be allowed to be able to say that. So that was their defense. OK, interesting. And the only reason they weaseled out and we didn't go to trial is because when you're a celebrity, you have a tremendous burden of proof that you have to prove what they call actual malice, okay, on, on the other side. Actual malice is they were doing it with all the wrong intention purposes. The problem was is there's front files, there's all sorts of false testimony. So they were relying on that, like the LA Times, uh, which in court we proved was just fabricated with lies and misleading statements exactly you know, now real quick dukes not to not to cut you off but i i, I want to say the first thing this being said because this is all in relation to it sure. basically and, and we're going to expand on what you were saying so Michael Bisbing said Dukes was outed as having never worked for the CIA and he was also never given the Medal of Honor by the Los Angeles Times. And he referenced the the Los Angeles Times article, which was more or less like a hit piece on you. Oh, of course it was a hit piece. It was really obvious. I mean, here good example. They said there's no evidence to find my instructor, Senzo Tanaka, existed that he came out of a James Vaughn movie. Meanwhile, the same paper published all the prisoners of Manzanar and all the internment camps, and there's Senzo Tanaka's name, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the actual records department, they're very clever and said, we couldn't find anything up to this day. Well, that's because he didn't die in May. He died in, in September and said, I had referred it, he died in May. No, John Keehan had died in May. Mm -hmm. um, and I never said I was a Medal of Honor. Or show me where I said I was a Medal of Honor. Show me where I said I even worked for the CIA. If you read my book, The Secret Man, right up front, the first couple of chapters, it talks about the fact that I was specifically put in that position because they didn't want me to come through the CIA and those things because they had a major intelligence leaks going on at that time. And we know that today to be true because people have been convicted for it. So, of course, they're going to go outside that. And plus, the operations I was involved in were identified by, you know, Gary Webb, who after the CIA made you know denials about these operations taking place. And we know that that's not true. We know that from the Iran Contra hearings. Mm -hmm. So and you personally know Gary Webb. You even have pictures with him. Not Webb. I have pictures of me with um Chip Tatum. Oh, that's the other Iran Contra guy. That's what I meant. Chip Tatum. Chip Tatum was the guy who took over General Secord Iran Operation Subgroups uh two, I think it was, involved with the transportation of narcotics. Chip Tatum was the actual 
guy who backlogged and wrote down that they were transporting uh, coolers of cocaine from the Contras, uh, filling up uh, fuel tanks and external fuel tanks with cocaine. No, it's snowing. Uh, to bring it, bring it into LA, which was later corroborated by by Gary Webb, and it was corroborated by in the testimony and arrest of uh, a gentleman they known as Freeway Ricky Ross. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and he's the one who outed the CIA's supply, being his supplier. Okay, and starting the crack epidemic in the United States. All right. Yeah, was crazy, stuff. Really crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Well, Real quick, Frank. Yeah. Real quick, Frank. Mm -hmm. Have you or have you not worked for the CIA? Not directly. I mean, not directly. Not, no, no. I worked for private private entities, mm -hmm. okay, and even foreign entities uh, under the auspices of, of the benefit of the CIA and certain intelligence organizations. Uh, the real work in those days, you know, nobody was. Working. I mean, look at Barry Seal. Barry Seal was taking pictures of what was going on the battlefield for the CIA. Barry Seal. He's a goddamn genius. <laughs> so he didn't directly work for the CIA. There's no connection to him to the CIA. Which is but a good we all point. Know so, Frank, yeah. when it says <laughs> he, which is obviously referring to you, was a CIA's <laughs> finest covert operative, that doesn't mean you directly worked for the CIA. No, it doesn't mean it at all. But people fact, just another, assume. A covert, here's, here's a good example. Another covert operative for the CIA was a guy that they, knew, that they call, and, and everybody knows if you really worked in that world, uh, was uh, the, what they call the Red Prince. You know, most civilians wouldn't know what that means, but the Red Prince was the number two man in Hezbollah. He was a CIA agent. He was a covert agent, mm -hmm. but he never worked at the, for the CIA directly. He was never a card-carrying agent. And the majority of guys who do that, who are working in those operations, were working directly for the CIA. I mean, Alexander Martin, the expert witness in Iran-Contra, it's paymaster identified me as being a covert operative. Admiral Horton Smith, who was the oldest serving flag officer in the U.S. Navy, won the Afghan medal at the age of 85. He's a sub commander, identified me under oath as working as a covert operative, being denied by my own country. Same as Martin. I know his military history started out as a good one, and that is with the Marine Corps. And he was enlisted Marine, and then he was involved, as far as I know, with special operations for the Marine Corps, which all of us have taken an oath that we cannot go and get too much into the details by reason of the fact of security concerns. But he was into special operations, and then, of course, operating with other government agencies. Uh, the uh Custodian of records for the U.S. Army when they were trying to show my military uh, records and it's, it's being passed around on the internet saying, oh, I'm a wireman and I'm this, um, testified to the fact that that record is consistent with covert operatives, that it's a front file, you know, put out there to see who's looking at me. The government tends to cloak or ghost a lot of your records because you're doing a lot of things that the general public doesn't really need to know about. You can see this character service is honorable. Uh, 0200, basic intelligence men for his uh, MOS, and related civilian occupation, and DOT number as intelligence specialist. Through my time being a records custodian, I've been able to pick up on some of these differences, and I've seen it more than once, not only with him, but with some of my own soldiers. Now, just looking at these two signatures side by side, um, you can tell that there are some obvious discrepancies just in the writing style. And then here it just looks like he got lazy and used a, a marker or something. And you can't even tell that that's a D in an X there. Uh, so it was obvious that this was done by, uh, the, the signatures on this page were done by several different people. And this, this one here shows that he has no combat experience, but, and no expeditions, no awards. Whereas on his uh, DD-214 actually shows that he was awarded the Good Conduct Medal. Basically what this implies is that a front file was created for Frank Dukes. And to me, the fact that there are some gaps in there indicates that he was on a very important mission at that particular time, which the government uh, certainly is aware of and uh, Frank probably still has awareness of, but uh, is not in the public interest to disclose. 
you know, those are the realities. They're all consistent. Benefits and pension certainly speak differently mm-hmm. to what's going on. Um, there's a preponderance of evidence that proves everything I've said is true, including the fact that Slade and Metcalf was a legal firm that's independent, that went out, had to vet my book, The Secret Man, before it could go to publication. I had to prove everything in it. And there's tons of stuff that was in the original manuscript that we had to take out Mm -hmm. because it couldn't be proven or it was too hearsay. You know, they didn't feel comfortable enough about it. And that's that's the reality. Whereas my detractors, they call a book uh, Stolen Valor that makes all sorts of allegations and attributes to me statements I never made. Okay, they hold up a picture of me, for example, that was taken in my college film class uh, in, in character and say I'm representing myself as uh, ha- having won the Medal of Honor. Where does that come from? So that isn't even on the ribbon that's thing. That, Speaking of that, that, Frank, you have a theory real quick on, on where this whole story of that you claim and you won the Medal of Honor came from. Can you talk yeah, about I, that? Yeah. Like the totally origin can. behind that. It totally came out of the LA Times. The LA Times is citing in there that yeah, they found a pamphlet of me making that statement. Mm-hmm. That same pamphlet, okay, was glued to the walls of Benny Akita's school. It was glued to um, Cecil People's school. Uh, the, the, the picture in that pamphlet is a picture that an LA Times reporter took. It's like me having crossed arms. It also shows up in the original printed version of that LA Times hit piece, okay? So it proves they manufactured the evidence. Well, you know, real simple. How could you have an, a picture of me taking my LA Times reporter, go into this pamphlet, and then that pamphlet is used as the proof that they cite in the article. It is interesting what Duke says here. You could see the LA Times article does use the same picture as this fake pamphlet. Another thing that sticks out in that fake pamphlet, by the way, It'll say Dukes' Rue Ninja Art. I've never heard or seen it referenced like that. It's always been referenced Dukes Rue. So it seems like a mistake that whoever put together that pamphlet made. And then it says Medal of Honor right here. And I've seen other literature, other pamphlets where they do talk about Dukes' military history, but they never mentions Medal of Honor. So yeah, whoever created this would have slipped that in there too. So it is quite interesting. It was created obviously by the LA Times, this reporter who didn't write an article, it's an editorial. It's, and because it's an opinion piece and an editorial, I cannot sue him for having an opinion, okay? Yeah, they have creative like liberties where they could just say whatever they want. Oh yeah, and if you read this article, you have to read it very carefully because anybody who's a trained journalist reads it and they go, this is a hit piece. Mm-hmm. It's obvious by the way they, they've structured it. Uh, they never said that Senzo Tanaka never existed. They just alluded to, it could have come from a James Bond movie. I have an active imagination. They could, they couldn't find any proof. Well, I can't, I can't hold somebody to the, to the fire who says they can't find any proof. Had they said he didn't exist, had they actually said that, then yes, I could maybe. Oh, so they were pretty careful, obviously, with how they just. That wrote whole it. article, if you read it very carefully, is legally couched. They brought up uh, their expert witness was Shoto Tanamura, a direct competitor of mine. Uh, this thing from Japan. He's opening a school down the street from me. Uh, Tanamura is saying there's no Tanakas in the whole history of, um, of the ninja clans. Okay. Uh, excuse me. There's Komodo Castle, the Tanaka Castle. All right. Right where Musashi is. There, the Tanaka's family line is involved in the Bujinkan itself. It's one of, they have three lines of in their school, the Bujinkan, which is nine schools. Three of those lineages are Tanaka lineages. Real quick, he, Frank, yeah, we're going to... Well, the last thing I want to point is, Tanamura himself was in a lawsuit with the Tanaka family over the soke ship of one of those lineages. He lost. Look, a lot of intelligent people, unfortunately, over the years, have been fooled by these bogus sources, these bogus as experts, okay? Misleading them, all right? Including Soldier Fortune magazine, which I called out on the carpet. Or like I said, Stolen Valor, which is a, a book that's not vetted. It's a self-published book. Let's get that straight, all right? On a side note, I think Stolen Valor should be exposed in general, but it's hard to say if the author, B.G. Burkett, is knowingly trying to smear certain individuals or if he's just misinformed. For example, on April 4th, 2004, there was an article put out by Newsmax that revealed B.J. Burkett's plan to smear Senator John Kerry's Vietnam record. 
On the August 26, 2004 edition of Fox News Channel's Hannity and Combs, Burkett followed Swift Boat veterans for the truth in issuing a series of false attacks against Kerry's military records. Unfortunately for the author and reader alike of Stolen Valor, since that's been exposed, you really have to question what he says about the other people in his book, such as Frank Dukes. It's a self-published book, and the guy's attributing to me, again, statements I never made. You know, like I claim to be a Medal of Honor winner and won all these. I never claimed that. Show me where I claim that. It comes off of this stupid, you know, article. And maybe like Sheldon Lenich and some other guys who are my corporate rivals saying, oh, yeah, he said it, you know, in front of me. You know, that kind of crap. You, you understand yeah, what I'm sure. saying? And not, not, show me somewhere where alone, out by itself, you can see me saying that. Let, let's go to his next point. Uh, this is a funny <laughs> one because. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way. A very interesting one, Frank. Yeah, he yeah. said that you claimed to have a 75 mile per hour kick. And then he's making fun of it, saying that's faster than a cheetah runs. Fastest animal on earth. It can move his legs pretty fast, but Frank Dukes can move his legs faster than a cheetah's legs. Well, first of all, if I have a 72 mile per hour kick, I hope he doesn't think I can run 72 miles per hour. 75, 75. Sorry. Oh, you said 75. No, yeah, my, my kick was recorded with knockout at 72 miles per hour. That's with knockout. Oh, okay. I could, I could kick much faster than that. Okay, but that's a recorded with a knockout. They did that by checking the frame speed, which is like, I think, 24 frames per second. I forgot what it is. Don't hold me to it, all right? I think they, didn't know, they shoot with high speed cameras it's different, too? It's a different speed. I don't know if it was shot on a 35 or 40 or, or eight millimeter or 16 when they did the film analysis. Mm -hmm. I just know that they, they had, uh, they, you can do it by, in those days you did it by frame speed. You could look at the, you know how many frames per, went per second and you just had to count the frames. You just look at them and go, da, 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 and then you could pretty much approximate what, what was going on. Yeah. Um, okay. And that's how they got that record. And yes, they had footage of it because they showed Black Ops Magazine when they were doing their due diligence on me. Uh, the Black Dragons gave it to them. They counted the frame, the, the frame speed. They could show them what happened. I don't know what happened to that footage afterwards. I have a good idea of what happened to it. It was destroyed because they were going to go promote Stephen Hayes as this ninja. And ninjutsu was a martial art. And, of course, I was saying, uh, no, there's no such thing as ninjutsu being a martial art, which was a total you know, contradiction to what they were trying to promote. Oh, Black Belt Magazine totally sold us on the ninjas, man. They even sold all that equipment like grappling hooks so we could like scale our neighbor's fence. But real quick, Frank, real quick, Frank, let me yeah. just point this out because because this, this, this is, this destroys. Let me, let, me answer. Let, me, let me finish an answer. Okay. So I don't want to, I, I know I'm digressing. So let me get back to, to, to what we're saying here mm -hmm. about the, the kick, the speed of the kick. Okay. Okay. Anybody who's a real fighter who really fights in the ring and has had some real quality opponents I mean, quality opponents knows that punches are flying way past 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. A good capoeira guy is kicking in, in, in the high 90s, okay? A good taekwondo guy is kicking above 100 miles per hour, okay? What's 72 miles per hour? It's not even it's, – it's below that rate. You yeah, it's quite that? below, and I'll, I'll, I'll further add to that because there's a, a National Geographic – fight science where they used all this like modern equipment and measured the speed of these kicks. I'm going to put a wireless accelerometer around your ankle and that'll tell us exactly how fast your leg is moving when you're doing your kick. So for example, Latif Crowder, Capoeira guy, uh, they clocked him at 99 miles per hour for his kick. Uh, Simon Reeves front kick, which are slower than like roundhouse kicks, 71 miles per hour. Uh, Levi Kratovich, Muay Thai roundhouse kick, 130 miles per hour. And last but not least, the fastest, Brent Foster, Taekwondo, 136 mm -hmm. miles per hour. So when, when Bisbing is making fun and saying, oh, 75 miles per hour, it's like, dude, this Taekwondo guy was clocked at 136. So if anything, 75 is slow. But for Bisbing, it's like light speed. Mm -hmm. And he can't even comprehend that somebody could kick that fast. It's, but he's using a cheetah analogy as running. It's like, so well, his head, he's got hit too much in his fighting. No, nah, I just, he's reaching. He, he's like all these other guys. He's just trying to drive a certain narrative and he's reaching and he's finding any way he can to try to, you know, mis, uh, inform the public and mislead the public to make himself look intelligent and important. Mm -hmm. That's all that is. You know, it's trying to grab, 
I have so many people attacking me through the years just to make themselves relevant. It's clout tracing. You know, blood sport has brought millions upon millions of people to the martial arts industry, inspired people. What, what is Bismuth, Mr. Bismuth done? Real Honestly. quick, Frank, I'll tell you what he's done. I'll tell you what he's done. He lost against the guy, GSP, who was inspired by Bloodsport, who was retired, who moved up a weight class and beat Bisbing. That's what Bisbing has done or didn't do, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So uh, maybe that's why he's got a grudge against me, you know, because the guy was inspired. <laughs> yeah, that's actually pretty funny, man. Yeah. So now he's out to get you, man. Uh, let's go to the next one here, which you kind of already covered because he was saying what 1975 technology would exist to measure such a thing. Remember, speed traffic cameras were only invented in the 90s. But you, you basically were saying, they, well, they just used film and counted frames. So that's how they measured it. And that was in the Black Belt magazine article back in like 1980 anyway. Right. Like the story's never changed. Well, exactly. My story has never changed over the years. You can you can look at it. You can look at uh, when I appeared on the Martial Arts Today show for NBC with Clifford Crandall. In, I think it was the early 90s. Um, I'm talking about ninjutsu and what I said about ninjutsu and, 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 you know, not being a martial art. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy. It's an operating system that you're supposed to take to your martial art to keep it relevant. So when these guys get stuck on this core root thing of like, this inflexible way, this is the way it's done and the only way you do it. I'm like looking and going like, that's not ninjutsu. Mm. That's, that's your own school of thought. You wanted to say that's your school? Great, do that. And that's what Hatsumi even did and said it himself. So uh, their own grandmaster is, is, is being contradicted by the lower students. You understand when they push this Koru thing and lineage as being important, it's not important. What's important is the philosophy, the operating system. Let's go to the next one. And we, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, this one involves Tanaka. So Bisbing said the character from James Bond's film who taught James Bond to be a ninja was Senzo Tiger Tanaka. Frank Duke said his ninja master as Tiger Tanaki. I mean, no points for originality on that one. Let's be honest. Here's the thing. In, in many ways, it's true. He hit it right on, but he doesn't understand it. And that is... Ian Fleming, if you actually studied the works of Ian Fleming, okay, James Bond was, was a, his favorite author on birds. You know, he was, a, he, he was really into birds. So he, he based his characters on real people. Major Boothroyd was a, was, a, was a college student friend of his. It was based on a real guy. Um, Q was based on a fan writing in about what, you know, what guns he should use in the, in the novels was incorrect, you know, that kind of thing. I think it was Sato in You Only Live Twice was based on his, a newspaper writer who was uh, his sort of like uh, counterpart, if you will, in Japan and helped him. So he created a character in that. And Senzo Tanaka was, uh, was a real person and really well known. The character was based on partially on him being known to Fleming uh, when he was deputy director of MI5 during World War II. And Kushiniga Tanaka was also known as the Tiger, um, was his counterpart. He was head of the station for Japan in London during those years. And Senzo was even known, I believe, in one of his relations. If you Google the, the Kano Spy School uh, on Google and you put in S. Tanaka, you can see a picture of his relation who was a teacher there. So it was based on a real Tanaka, a real, you know, um, Tiger Tanaka, if you will, which is a common name. They even called uh, Tagamatsu, who was the teacher to Hatsumi, who's famous for the Bujikan, one of the largest things of promoting ninjutsu and creating the ninja boom. I mean, Tagamatsu was known as the playful tiger. So, you know, tiger is a common name. In Shotokan, they even use the symbol of a tiger. You know, it's not a big deal. Real quick, Frank. So, but we were... Tanaka himself is proven. You can go on Ancestry.com. Uh, Heartvoice.com did an ar ar article talking about the existence of Tanaka and that the so-called uh, thoughts that my teacher was non-existent uh, is all rubbish, you know? Mm -hmm. And like I said, the LA Times lied. They had it printed right there in their own, their own, their own paper. They had published, I think, a story on and a list of all the internment Japanese, and there was Senzo amongst them. 
And he was, by the way, recruited at age 53 to go work in Hawaii after the attack of Pearl Harbor. I mean, come on. What do you think he was doing in Pearl Harbor as a Japanese? Interesting. And then, and then he supposedly was in prison, by the way. You look at records. He was in turn in prison, but they also have records of him traveling to Japan and back all through the war. So my own personal. Yeah, he's basically a spy then. Actually, the real spy was his wife. Really? Yes. And she's uh, Saya Cicada. And she was uh, part of the Cicada family, which if you do your samurai research, you'll find that that family is responsible for guarding the emperor. They go all the way back and they were his spies and she, he was married into that family. So wow. there you go. Let me ask you this real quick, Frank, and I'm not going to name the guy's name. You know who I'm talking about, or you will in a second. Did you ever get all these documents proving all this lineage with the Tanakas yeah, it's, from that guy? It's, yes. I, I didn't did get, get it. That, we're, still, we're still waiting, but they're, they're on list with the national archives. He had them. We both know what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. They yeah, sure. They're there. Um, you know, I had a falling out with the gentleman because he wanted me to make him a black belt and I wouldn't, mm-hmm. but, you know, right away. I did honor him having a belt. He had to go through training. He'd have to go through testing. I made that very clear. He was supposed to come to Mexico with me. Uh, and all of a sudden he found every excuse in the world that he couldn't go, you know, and then, then he just turned on. Me. So, yeah, you know, yeah. That, and, that, that was a little drama it, there it, going it, on, but oh, um, man, we, we don't need to talk it, too, too much more about him. Uh, the unnamed. I'm not even going to go there. My, yeah. my point is a lot of people see the vulnerability of these lies and have tried to exploit them for their own gain. You know, in this case, this person's wife was an actual due diligence person for the UN. She went through it. He's been on talk shows talking about how he saw the proofs, how it's there. It's not a, a mystery about it. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, he told me on the phone and, that, and, you know, about and, all that stuff. But even before that, you go to Art Voice. Years before that, they did an investigation, they, mm-hmm. and they were able to find existence of his records, of, of the existence of Senzo Tanaka. So he's not an imaginary person. Okay, yep. there's records. There's, there's records of him coming into the United States. His birth certificate, his death certificate, uh, and everything coincides with everything I've ever said about him. His age, where he lived, and I'm not the only person who was trained by him. There's Dr. Day, who's head of the Black Dragons, trained by him. Dr. Miskell, who succeeded, uh, succeeded Day, w- knows and met, met Tanaka. You have Ernie Reynolds, who's trained and ranked by him. Uh, and numerous other great martial artists, right down to uh, even Ed Parker knowing of, of Senzo Tanaka, because Senzo Tanaka trained Chow, and his successor knows that. Because Chow, Chow would kill cattle in or pigs, excuse me, in Hawaii using the open hand techniques, the dim mock, if you want to call it that. And that later became the signature style of Kempo Karate under Ed Parker. So there's yeah, a, that's there's fascinating a, martial arts history, no doubt. Sure. But just going down the list of, of, of his argument sure, against sure. you. Yeah. Um, he said, Do said that submission holds would not work. He said they are not effective in real fights. So did you say that? Yeah. I, and I, in I, what context? I said it in the context of like, if we're on a battlefield, I'm not going to, why are we on a battlefield? Would I turn around and try to submit you when I've got a dagger and a pistol in my hand? Hmm. So you, were you not referring to like Kumite matches then or? Well, Kumite matches didn't, first of all, you're, you're getting jumped in at every minute, right? You don't want to be on your back trying to submit a guy. Uh, did we have chokeouts and things like that happen? Of course we did. Did we have submissions happen? Of course you can. So that's in blood sport. Do you remember the end Thank of the you. movie? The submission, right? So for him to say, I don't even understand what context he's referring to or where it came from, because he often, like I said, he pulls things out of out of out of context in a number of things. You know oh yeah, yeah, and and we'll talk about one a little bit later at the end of this uh, something really good that that he took out of context. So, but um, but, to, but to be clear, to answer your question, mm-hmm. uh, no, I'm not. If I'm on a battlefield, no, I'm not going to try to submit you. I'm not. Oh, try like to even just on the street, that's not even a battlefield. I wouldn't do that at Seven you Eleven. Know it's 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 all relative, and I'll make this clear to everybody. 
I'm not, I'm not against submission holds. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is a good Kumite fighter will put you down before you even get a chance mm -hmm. because you can hit behind the ear. You understand? You can do certain moves that you cannot do in a UFC match or a, U or a MMA match. That's why those rules exist. You know, I, I, a good example of that is uh, if you try to tackle me, right, I can attack your brainstem. It's over. You get yeah, Steven Seagal does the same thing. He even hurt. talks about that himself, you know, and like, yeah, he basically articulates kind of what you're saying. Like you, you can go to the ground, you can grapple, but uh, you really shouldn't. <laughs> you know? Well, here's a good example. There was a, there's a video on YouTube with an MMA fighter fighting a special forces guy. They're both special forces guys. One's a Panamanian and one, one is a guy who's actually more or less trained by my system because it's bled through. Mm -hmm. And he does exactly what I, I've taught SEALs to do and, 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 and the training. And that is the guy goes in and tries to do a double takedown, lift him up and hurt him. And so as he leans in to get him, and you, you can maybe we can find this and show it. He just uses a, 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 his thumb, jabs it in the guy's eye, and he's out. Mm -hmm. Two seconds later, he's stepping back, and he's out unconscious. Sure. Had he pushed it hard enough up, and, up in a certain way, I don't want to describe on the channel, but there's a way you, you use your thumb in a certain way. That guy would have died right there on the spot. End of story. It's done because it, it, the way that injury inflicts, uh, it, you're, you're basically almost like shooting the brain with a 45. You know how to do it right. Mm -hmm. The same thing. Wow. It says the same faction. This is how SEALs train. They don't train to necessarily take you down and submit you and get you to surrender. They learn that. Because how are you going to take prisoners? You can't keep killing everybody. You know, if you want to get a prisoner, you got to learn how to extract a guy. So for extraction purposes, there are certain th ways you train. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually going into a hostile combat situation where it's, you know, kill or be killed, well, you're going to go the other way. So you have to have, and my, my belief to be a real warrior today, you have to have a wider range of tools to work with. You have to have those skill sets where, yes, you can subdue someone and submit someone. So for me to say that, oh, that's, that doesn't happen or it's not good to study is ridiculous. At the same time, you have to have the skill sets to dispense a threat right away, not get entangled with them in any way, because you may be oh, fighting, you know, three, four times the number of people like you saw in Benghazi, you know, when these guys were, were trying to rescue the, amb the ambassador. The guy survived. You know, only because they're able to take on mass numbers of guys at the same time. Mm -hmm. The ones who survived that attack. So you have to put things again in its proper perspective. Yeah, and exactly. Exactly. So again, he's just trying to make you look bad by saying, oh, Frank said this, you know, and I didn't uh, about grappling. Yeah, and I didn't say that. That's ridiculous. A lot of your early training was with grappling with Jack Secchi, right? Judo, jiu-jitsu? started my, my first formal training is in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so people so, question your grappling, you know, because may, maybe because they just get the image of blood sport and helicopter kicks and Van Damme moves in their head, you know, they associate that with Frank Dukes, obviously, but you, uh, your origin is like in grappling and then obviously you got crazy striking too, but um, real quick, Frank, let's move to the next one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, and we talked about this a little bit, this is the one that, uh, you know, a lot of people will try to say, and we've already explained this in a video together. It made sense of it, but Biz being still going on that whole thing saying that you claim the Kumite was a 60 round single elimination tournament. And then he goes on how the math doesn't make sense. 576 quadrillion, 460 trillion, 752 billion, 303 million, 423,408 t8 people that's a lot of people but you broke it down it's like the masuyama he had 100 man tournaments i mean there's nothing crazy about the math you always talk about you know people comparing apples and oranges which makes sense because you, you got to look at it different we're just used to what we're seeing these days with the ufc yeah i mean look it's just it's 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 ridiculous i mean the math we explained it i think you did a wonderful show on that the first mm -hmm. show we interview you had with me was explaining the math oh yeah I, I i would ask mr bismil to go check out the your video since he, he should as an education yeah. lesson and after he watches it 
Yeah. I think that he should make a public apology to you. Yeah. Yeah. Balls in his court. So he kind of ended that video that he did, which was very popular. So a lot of people seen it. He said, Dukes is still at it. In 2016, he said that he could beat every reigning UFC champion of the world. And I just want to say in 2016, Frankie boy, I was the champion. Don't be scared, homie. So, you know, give me a call. The first thing I want to point out, Frank, is that uh, when that guy who interviewed you in 2016, he said in your prime. In your prime, 1975 to 1980, you take Frank Dukes from then, put him in a UFC octagon in 2016. Are you the UFC heavyweight world champion? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. So he wasn't talking about you being older as whatever age you were in 2016, but Bisbing makes it sound like you said that at your current age of 2016. That guy asked you in your prime. In your prime. So that's another thing Bisbing takes out of context and tries to make right. you look bad. Now, with that said, let me ask you a couple of things about Bisbing. How do you think he would have fared in the Kumite matches that you were involved in, in like, you know, 75, for example, in that era? You know, it, it, I don't know enough about him to make that judgment call. I'll mm -hmm. be honest with you. I just don't, you know. Uh, but based on what I'm hearing and how he conducts himself, I don't think he'd do really well. I don't think he would either. I don't, I don't think he would either. <laughs> like, would you actually fight Michael Bisbing, like, hypothetically tomorrow if given the chance, if he wanted to or if, if you wanted to? Well, first of all, it depends on what, what are the terms of the fight you know let's say a celebrity the, boxing the, match the, the the really popular you know celebrity I, boxing I could, match. here's 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 the reality i couldn't fight him the state would never allow it because i'm 100 percent disabled veteran i've mm -hmm. got you know i've got uh, my neck is at the point where it's turning the other way because of all the trauma i've had in my life where it's actually pushing on the fecal sac so i legally couldn't even get in the ring even if i wanted to you know that's that's the reality situation Second of all, I have no desire to go back and train with, with what it is. I'm retired. I'm 66 years old, you know. Where was he uh, even in 2016? That was the case, you know, six years ago, you know. Yeah, I was, sure. We win. <laughs> well, know? let me ask so, you this, Frank. Yeah. In your prime, you versus this thing, what happens? I destroy him. Like, do you think the fight would even last one minute? No. Not even close. In I'm fact... Sure. You probably I, I, break I, a new I, 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 record. I broke the fucking world record. Yeah, my buddy. You know, I don't know what else. I don't know what else to to, to really say about about this whole thing with this guy. But I hope he would he come to his senses and apologize because obviously we've just shown that everything he said is not true. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, he's yeah. attributing to me. Yeah. How do these guys get to me? They attribute to me statements I never made. And take things out and of then, context, which we proved with, you know, a few things, even the, the right. interview you had in 2016, and then he's making you look ridiculous with his cheat analogy and like all this other stuff. I have this to, I have this to say to him. When you lie to people, okay, when you mislead them intentionally, or whether or even, even doing it uh, out of ignorance, uh, you're the one being fraudulent. So the mm -hmm. real fraud here is me. It's, it's, is this is this guy? That's all I can say. That's the real problem.